Utah's Jurassic dinosaurs tend to get all the glory and press, but its Jurassic marine fossils are just as interesting and somewhat poorly known. During the late Jurassic period, a shallow sea expanded into northern Utah, leaving behind a fossil record of marine animals. My name is Benjamin Berger and I'm a geologist here in Utah, and in this episode of The Rocks of Utah, we're searching for fossils from the Jurassic period that lived 163 million years ago. Why am I so curious about looking at these rocks? Well, I'm hoping to find some ammonites. Now, ammonites are a group of marine shelled animals that are related to octopuses and squids. The earliest ammonites appeared during the Devonian, and they lasted until the end Cretaceous extinction, when they vanished with the non-avian dinosaurs 66 million years ago. Ammonites were predatory marine animals that resembled squid or octopuses, but had a spiral shell. They differ from the living genus Nautilus and its extinct relatives, and having complex suture lines. The septa of the ammonites are convex, with the curve pointing outward toward the opening, while in nautiloid septa, the, they are concave, with the curve pointing inward toward the center of the shell. The last and largest of the chambers, the body chamber where the organism lived, is thought to have been actually protected by a hard atyptus shell, a paired shell, but it may have actually served as double-plated jaws for actually crushing prey. Ammonites are very important to geologists because they are useful in determining the age of the rock layers that they are found in. What's exciting about the layer of rocks that we are going to be looking for ammonites within is that the same types of ammonites have been found on the other side of the earth, over in Britain and Europe, where the same genre of fossils are found in rock layers clear on the other side of the world. The Oxfordian is a stage or age of the late Jurassic, first described in Britain, based on fossils from Oxford, England. The Oxfordian stage is defined based on its ammonite fossils, which includes a genus named Cardioceras. The older Calvin stage or age of the Jurassic uh, period is partly defined on the occurrence of another genus, a genus named Quantsteto serratus. Now, both Cardioceratus and Quinsteto serratus have been described from these layers of rocks in the western part of the United States, and I wanted to see if we can find some of these ammonites and possibly other marine fossils to kind of refine the dating of these rock layers. The rock layer that we are going to be looking at today has been given two lithostratigraphic names. In Idaho and Wyoming, the rock layer is known as the Stump Formation, while in eastern Utah and western Colorado, it's known as the Curtis Formation. Northern Utah, I often see either name referenced. Sometimes the Curtis is defined as the lower member of the Stump Formation. In Montana and eastern uh, Wyoming, the formation is called the Sundance Formation, and it's a uh, reddish shale, similar to the reddish shale that's actually found down in southern Utah, which is called the Somerville Formation. Now, both of these rock layers were deposited at the same time, but because they have different characteristics, they're kind of a reddish shale, and the rocks we're going to look at today are kind of grayish, limestones and sandstones. Um, a bit of shale, they are, those are lithologically different stratigraphic units. So these red shale deposits were made in the very shallow tidal flats that extend further south and east uh, when this Jurassic Seaway extended into western North America. The Sundance Formation is famous for its fossil record of ichthyosaurs, marine reptiles that resemble modern-day dolphins. The Seaway is either called the Sundance Seaway or the Curtis Seaway. I prefer the Sundance Seaway. It has a nice ring to it, and I could imagine it being a really good vacation stop for time travelers to the Jurassic period. The Sundance Seaway. 
has a nice ring to it. Now, for those of you who've enjoyed my video on the Jurassic Morrison Formation, the Stump Curtis Formation is the layer of rocks just below the Morrison Formation. Hence, many of the dinosaurs found in the Jurassic of Utah lived on the dried ocean basin that formed several million years after the disappearance of the Sundance Seaway. One of the great American paleontologists that worked on these uh, marine Jurassic fossils um, and published many of the classic papers on the subject was a fellow named Ralph Emley who worked for the United States Geological Survey back when the federal government employed paleontologists to map and to determine the ages of rocks within the United States. He was very dedicated to the study of, of marine fossils and his work is a, is a treasure trove of information on the fossils from these Jurassic layers across the American West. So we found our first uh, marine fossils here. We're seeing these little clamshells in here. And these are probably a genus called Camptonectes, which is known from the, uh, the Jurassic and pretty common in, uh, in this formation. One of the things I, I think is really fabulous about the stump or Curtis formation is just like start looking down at the rocks you start seeing like a lot of little clam shells and all sorts of little marine organisms that are forming the limestones of this unit. So here you can see more of those little bivalves, little clams. They're usually pretty small so Camptonectes is a pretty small little little shell. They usually get to be uh, no bigger than a fingernail. So I thought I would find one of these. So I'm very excited to find this. This is our first cephalopod fossil. Um, this bullet-shaped um, little fossil is a creature uh, called a blemonite. So the scientific name for this uh, the species is Pachyuthius densius. And blemonites uh, would have had a squid-like body, um, but unlike modern uh, squid, they actually had a hard internal skeleton, and that's what this is. Um, this is kind of similar to uh, living cuttlefish. Uh, they have cuttlefish stones, um, and that's kind of what this is, uh, equivalent to it. Now, the internal skeleton formed this bullet-shaped skeleton, um, and it's sometimes referred to as a rostrum or a guard. And the rostrum or guard acted as sort of a counterbalance uh, to the head and tentacles, which would have been over here. And uh, so they would have swam around like this, and this would have been at the end as sort of a counterbalance. Now, um, this, this fossil is composed of um, calcium carbonate. It's a fibrous calcium carbonate, calcite crystals. They're arranged kind of in these right angles to each other. So if you look inside there, you can see that they're kind of in right angles to each other, so sticking out. Um, and they grow kind of um, concentric patterns, kind of like growth rings, um, like a tree trunk. Um, a lot of times they'll have paler layers inside, but a lot of them are kind of darker colored. Um, so it's mere, nearly pure calcite that they're composed the, uh, these out of, um, but the darker layers are blackened by the presence of organic matter, uh, mostly carbon. Now, there's often, in really better preserved specimens, there'll be like a hole in the center of this thing, and that would hold air for buoyancy to help it, you know, uh, uh, swim along, keep it kind of buoyant in the front. Now, really well-preserved ones will actually even have um, what's called a pro-osticum, which is basically a thin flap that extends on, on, would have extended onto the body, into the body, kind of on a, a thicker end on this thing. And most of them don't have that. It's kind of rare that you find it. The interesting thing about this is that these rings that are in here uh, represent growth of the animal, probably over periods of months 
And some researchers at UVU have studied the oxygen isotopes of these growth rings and found that the ocean water was between about 17 to 20 degrees uh, Celsius. So that's about the same temperature as um, uh, the oceans in Southern uh, California. So I'm super excited to have found one of these little fossils. I was expecting to find one and I'm glad I did. These are really common in the Jurassic uh, marine deposits here in Utah, especially in the Stumpf and Curtis Formation. Got some nice bigger um, oysters here and they're clams. These look like a different different genus. They're quite quite large. This piece looks like it might have eroded down but a lot of clams so that's we're getting close to some ammonites hopefully so finding a lot of a lot of clams there's a really nice one right there beautiful little jurassic clam this whole surface is covered in little little bivalves look at these little guys right there it's a beautiful one got some little grooves I think so can be identified but just covered in these little these little clams okay I found something really cool this is the biggest ever bleemonite I have ever found holy smokes look at how huge that thing is wow <laughs> This was a giant bleemonite. Look at there's the there's the the calcite extending out. This thing is is enormous. I find them kind of cigarette size, but but uh, this thing is that's a monster. It's a pretty big one. A bleemonite. That would have been a giant squid. Tentacles coming out. Blah! swimming along blah, blah, blah. that's cool here's a beautiful one right here just looking down so these guys are found they're pretty common um, and it's neat that you can use them to figure out what the the uh, ocean temperature was back in the Jurassic in the seaway uh, very cool. So these are cephalopods. We're just trying to find ammonites. Um, now I have to warn you, I have only found a piece of an ammonite from um, near here uh, a few years ago. And that's why I'm out here actually. Try to find some more that's identifiable. Um, looking through the record, this particular area in, in northern Utah uh, tends to have lots of bivalves and lots of bleemonites. Um, cephalopods, but not as many ammonites, although I do know of a couple of occurrences of ammonites, so that's what I'm hoping to find out here. Oh, wow. That looks like a, a bivalve, but just looking at that, there's a nice, nice bivalve right there. So right there, a little bit of the shells coming out. You can just see the grooves on it. That's a nice one. So some really nice ones. So. Um, so if we're finding this stuff, I think we should be able to find some ammonites. If we spend enough time, it's like a little shell just sitting there. <laughs> so we're getting a little closer to finding some things. Just looking at this. There's a little ridge there. It looks like an ammonite, but it's it's pretty crappy. But that's kind of what I find. <laughs> I've been out here before, and I'm hoping to find something better than this. Let's see if we can find something better. Bunch of. Uh little clam shells. It's starting to get a little dark. So I think the, these are these clams here are some gripphia. 
which are also known as the devil's toenail, which are a type of um, oyster-like bivalve that lived in the Jurassic and into the Cretaceous. Um, I find them in the Cretaceous more often, but you do find them here in the Jurassic. And uh, you can see they kind of keep growing layers on top of each other, kind of like modern oysters do. You can see some here. And they have kind of a weird toenail shape to them. Um, you can see a bunch of them in here. And they are found in the stump formation. And there's quite a few of them. Um, so you can see how they kind of grow, undulate like little toenails. <laughs> so directly underneath the um, stump formation is the Entrada sandstone, which is right there. So that's the Entrada right down there. And so this seaway sits right on top of the, the uh, Entrada sandstone. So the Entrada, Entrada is Aeolian deposits. It's much thicker further south um, around Moab. Uh, you get quite a bit thicker Entrada. Um, but then we have the stump or Curtis formation sitting right on top of it up here. So it's deeper waters um, up here um, and it would extend down into the south into the Somerville formation down there. Um, but there's the, we're at near the bottom of the, the formation here. So you know you're looking really well when you start to find coins <laughs> instead of ammonites. <laughs> yeah, I found a dime. Nice. So we did not find any ammonites. Any real definite ammonites, that is. So thank you very much for watching. I've not been able to post as many videos onto YouTube uh, the last few months because of my busy work schedule. Um, but thanks for your patience, especially those of you on Patreon and your continued encouragement for me to make educational content uh, for you to enjoy. Thank you to my supporters, Fred Olney, Marlo Andreco, Brian Clever, Magnus Silvang, Pablo Lozato Figuez, Dan Chopsaw, Max McGregor, Sean Cormitt, Justin Bovey, and Emmett Larson. Thank you everyone for your support and patience, and hopefully you'll be seeing more of me um, in the future, though it is late November, so I don't know how much I can film in the field uh, until we get some snow on the ground, and then I'll be filming in the studio. So hope to see you around. Thank you for watching.